Welcome back to the Electronic Intifada podcast. I'm Nora Barrows Friedman with Tamara Nassar. Today, we're taking a look at Israel's relentless attacks on hospitals and medical workers in Gaza. We're especially focusing on the situation at Nasser Hospital in Khan Yunus. According to the Palestinian Health Ministry on Thursday, Israeli forces attacked the hospital and ordered patients, staff, and displaced people sheltering in the hospital complex outside into adjacent buildings. The health ministry said that Israeli forces ordered officials at Nasser Hospital to move 95 health personnel, 11 of their families, 191 patients, and 165 companions, and displaced people in an old building adjacent to the hospital in harsh and frightening conditions, without food, without milk for children, and an acute water shortage. Dr. Khaled al sent these voice messages to us on Thursday. Uh, since yesterday, there is a, a lot of updates uh, about what's happening here in Nasser Hospital. Uh, there was a uh, direct bombing to the hospital. Uh, they forced people inside the hospital, including patients, relatives. Oh, ya Allah. Patients, relatives, and uh, healthcare workers to evacuate immediately. And you can hear in the background the continuous bombing in the hospital. 18th of February, and after complete evacuation of all refugees, uh, most of the healthcare workers and most of the patients uh, under bombing, direct bombing of uh, hospital buildings and killing patients and injuring impatience on their beds. Today, the war crimes continues as the Israeli army uh, instructed all the healthcare workers and all patients to be displaced from all buildings in the Nasser Hospital to one department, which is uh, the oldest building in the Nasser Medical Complex. Uh, all of the patients are condensed and crowded in the corridors in the medical department. Uh, we have to move with our hands, with collaboration with our colleagues. Together, we have to move about 65 patients uh, using one elevator from the surgical uh, department, which consists of a four floors building, uh, to the uh, medical department. And now all the medical personnel and all patients are condensed in, in one department. Israeli soldiers and tanks uh, continue to shoot and bomb in the nearby area inside and outside the hospital. Uh, we hear uh, the tanks moving inside the hospital. We cannot look through the windows or to see if there is any soldiers inside uh, the hospital. Uh, That was Dr. Khaled al -Sir. He also sent videos of patients lined up in a corridor inside the medical building after being forced out of the main hospital by Israeli forces. Here, as you can see, all of the people are condensed in one corridor. All of the patients inside the Yassin Hospital Surgical Department has been moved here to the medical department at the oldest building, Nasser Medical uh, Building. This comes after a week of intensifying attacks on the hospital and its grounds, with armed Israeli quadcopters shooting at patients, doctors, and hospital staff, and Israeli armored vehicles destroying parts of the wall around the complex. Early Thursday morning, Israeli forces shelled the patient ward at Nasser Hospital. Dr. al -Sir sent us this video of doctors scrambling to move their patients out in the immediate aftermath of the bombing. Oh, 
Now, on Friday, the Palestinian Health Ministry reports that, quote, three patients died in intensive care as a result of the power outage and the cessation of oxygen in the Nasser medical complex. Two women gave birth in inhumane conditions without electricity, water, food, and heating, and a fourth patient at Nasser was martyred as a result of the cessation of electrical generators and the cessation of oxygen at dawn on Friday. Israeli occupation forces forced men, women, and children to move from the old Nasser building without luggage to the maternity building, which they turned into a military barracks. That was from the health ministry on Friday morning. Joining us to talk about the current situation at Nasser Hospital and Israel's systematic and relentless targeting of hospitals across Gaza is Dr. Mads Gilbert. Mads is a Norwegian physician who for years has worked alongside doctors and nurses in Gaza. Dr. Mads, welcome back to the Electronic Intifada podcast. Thank you so much under dire conditions, but still good to see you. Thanks uh, to you so much as well. Um, Mads, you've been in touch with doctors and medical staff at Nasser Hospital over the last week. Give us a sense of what they're dealing with. I mean, we we just saw those images of patients being ordered to evacuate, others lined up on their gurneys in the corridor of an older building. And of course, we've heard the reports of quadcopters shooting at anyone who moves inside the hospital and in, and in the courtyard uh, near the entrance to the emergency department. What is going on here and what are you hearing from your colleagues there? Actually, what is going what is going on in Nassar Hospital is pretty much the same that's been going on in almost all the Palestinian hospitals and healthcare units, also the primary healthcare system, for the last four months. This is uh, a nadir, uh, a very low point in this long array of Israeli systematic attacks on healthcare, on healthcare providers on patients, on companions to the patients, and on the thousands and thousands of forcefully displaced Palestinians who have been seeking refuge and safety, some kind of safety, in their hospitals. So what we're seeing at Nasser now is the culmination of a systematic uh, uh, operation mode by the Israeli occupation army, uh, which actually has uh, the goal of dismantling healthcare in Gaza as it has been working for the last 20 years and destroying it completely. And with that destruction comes, of course, the, the lack of uh, sufficient medical capacity for the wounded and for those with common diseases, for the pregnant women, as we heard. Um, and it is a systematic way of um, attacking the Palestinian people. Uh, and all these claims about, you know, you know, now the claim was Hamas operatives and hostages. So far, we haven't seen any proof of that, as we didn't see in Shifa or in um, the cancer hospital, in the Turkish Friendship Hospital or in Rantisi Hospital. So what the heroic Palestinian healthcare workers in Nasser Hospital have been reporting is actually that they have been continuing to treat patients inpatients and patients who were brought to them despite of the siege of Nasser Hospital that has been going on for, I guess, the better part of three weeks mm -hmm. with surrounding tanks, uh, threats, shooting, targeting, uh, quadrocopters. And then finally, the last few days, snipers shooting through the windows of the, the, the rooms in the hospital and even shooting into the ICU and into the doctor's room and into any, anywhere where there are human beings. So they have been continuing their work. Um, some of them left yesterday. Uh, some of them were shot at during the uh, evacuation, not evacuation, but when they left the hospital, presumably through the safe routes that Israel is lying about. And some are still in the hospital. And I'd like to read to you the text that accompanied that movie, that little video you showed of the overcrowded corridors in this uh, building to which the Palestinians have been forced to evacuate the patients uh, and the staff, which is, by the way, the oldest part of Nasser medical complex. And he says in this uh, message, the situation now at Nasser hospital, all of the patients and healthcare workers 
were displaced to one department. One other buildings have been invaded by soldiers. We can hear the shooting and bombings everywhere. And then he continues and he finishes up saying, please stop this madness, stop this war. This is a hospital facility, not a battlefield, unquote. That's the appeal of a, an extremely brave uh, medical doctor among the, the, the thousands of brave healthcare personnel in Gaza who have never yielded and never left their patients. So uh, my point is that it's horrible. And the most horrible thing about what is going on in Nassar Hospital now is that this has been going on for four months without no power stopping it. So um, I don't know. I think the Israelis, with their impunity, they just keep going because no military force or political force or international alliance of decent nations are able to stop them. The only one who can stop them is, is the United States, and they don't want to stop them. They continue to su supply them with political support and weapons. So this madness is a result of a deliberate politics, a, a de deliberate policy from the United States, and uh, unfortunately also from many of the, the European governments. Yeah. So, um, so um, I am extremely uh, uh, anxious about the fate of these remaining patients and medical staff. The last numbers I got from uh, uh, Dr. Um, the, the information head, uh, Dr. Ashraf al Quadra from the Minister of Health, that was yesterday. But, you know, it's not only 190 staff or whatever the number is now but they had almost 300 family members with them. Right. Uh, and it's important to understand that both patients and staff and the refugees or displaced, forcefully displaced person, they, they, they stick to their families because the family is the last life jacket of a Palestinian family in Gaza now. Because the family, and there is a solid bunch of research on this, the most important resilience factors, in particular for Palestinian children in the West Bank and in Gaza, it is the family and the family system. Uh, and then it is, of course, the, the attachment to culture, to, uh, to Palestine, to faith, to Islam, and then the greater cause of, of fighting for Palestine. But these 190 staff had 300 family members, the uh, 237 patients, that were uh, in uh, uh, Nassau Hospital uh, by yesterday morning, had 327 family members and companions. So you can double the number. And of course, the 1,500 displaced who had been seeking shelter were also families. And many of them are now forcefully evicted and has uh, started on the journey to Rafa while being shot at. It's it's uh, unconscionable uh, what we're seeing and hearing uh, from Nasser and, and around. And, and as you said, it's a microcosm of what's happening all over Gaza. Um, can you talk about the incident on Wednesday where a detained Palestinian man was sent by the Israeli army to deliver their orders to evacuate the hospital? Uh, this man was dressed in personal protective equipment. His hands were tied. And then after they were done with him, uh, with using their human shield, essentially, the Israelis executed him on the spot. Uh, the Intercept had this article about that incident, um, and it also included a video. I think we can we can show that. So what happened today is a completely trap, completely trap. They sent uh, a hostage with cuff hands to the hospital, asking him to tell us that we should evacuate. And when people started really uh, evacuating, uh, they opened fire and they shoot it at the people and they killed the hostage also. That already sent by the IDF at the gate of the hospital. And uh, uh, how to say it? Uh, we used to use a, a safe corridor. This corridor actually located at the western part of the hospital between the surgical building and medical building, which is called Amasaf building, where we used to work, we as a Amasaf staff. Just like half an hour back, I came from surgical building through this corridor to the medical building. 
Just I entered the, 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 the building, the snipers shooted three people, three young people. And this is means that nobody should use this corridor anymore. And now I'm completely trapped at this medical building or which is called a massive building. And this building, uh, actually, uh, it is away from the, 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 the main gate of the hospital, about 50 meters only. So we are away from the tanks, only 50 meters. And this is very dangerous. Dr. Mads, I mean, we didn't see any Western media cover, uh, you know, major corporate Western media cover what happened um, to that uh, that detained man who was sent by the Israelis uh, to deliver their order to uh, to evacuate and then was uh, summarily executed. Um, what do you make of this? What what how 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 did this happen? Well, I think it is in many ways, uh, uh, we, we should maybe not be shocked. Right. But when you look at the individual level, how the Israelis are treating the Palestinians, you get this sickening feeling of a racism and a disregard for human life that you, you, you would not believe existed in our time on a, on a one-to-one -one level. I mean, using an F-35 to fly over Gaza and do some pinpoint or, or just a bomb dropping you're not looking in the eyes of the other person, the other human. But this guy, he was forced at gunpoint to go and tell his fellow Palestinians, you have to evacuate. And one thing you did not comment was that ironically, they had put a yellow band on his head. And for those who knows history is of course, the yellow color and the yellow star used to be the way the Nazis were marking the Jews, if you had that yellow star, you were doomed. So I don't know why they put that yellow band on his head. But to me, that has a very dark symbolism. He tries to convince his fellow Palestinians, I have a message, you have to leave. And this is, don't forget, this is after days and days of shouting from loudspeakers and from the the uh, the drones with loudspeakers. And we've seen videos how they call them out as animals and dirty, whatever, you know, the Israelis, they shout to the people in Nasser, a very derogating, very, uh, you know, shameful uh, naming of them. And then they send this, um, this brave Palestinian in. And it's a human shield. He comes back and they kill him. So if anybody dares tell me that the Israeli army, the occupation army are not killers and murderers, you know, uh, just look at this one situation. And it has to me a, a greater um, ramification and symbolism. It is that they don't, they don't dare face sort of a man to man or woman to woman situation. They, they handcuff you, mm -hmm. they, they undress you, they force you to creep on the floor. I just got a message from, from uh, a young Palestinian medical student that his father was released right now today. Another brilliant Palestinian doctor who has been working with fearless, risking his life for four months. He's a colleague of mine. I've known him for 15 years. He was arrested three days ago. They released him today and they had tortured him. Like they have tortured so many of our colleagues while being in prison or in the concentration camp. This to total disregard for, for human life, this lack of respect for others than themselves is, I think, one of the, the, the main, um, one of the main, I, I don't like the word challenge, but the, the, the huge problem that we're facing is actually how the Western world with the United States as the leader and the EU governments and the Canadians and the Australians until, was it yesterday, have been supporting this massive Israeli racism and colonialism against the Palestinian people day by day, knowing what is going on, seeing the videos on social media, 
And don't tell me that the deep state, that uh, State Department and the intelligence in the United States doesn't know every single one of these incidents and they accept it and they continue to support Israel. And that's why I, I say that this is this may be a, a very uh, disturbing uh, illustration on, uh, on what um, has been called uh, necropolitics by Achille Mbembe. Uh, so we may discuss later. But I'd like to point to another uh, uh, fact. This is a report that came out today, actually. It's from the WHO. And it is summing up the number of attacks on healthcare in Gaza from the 7th of October until the um, 12th of February, a few days ago. And there has been not one, not two, not 10. There has been 378 attacks on healthcare in Gaza by the Israeli occupation army through these months. Almost 400 attacks. It's 100 attacks per month on an average. And 659 people have been killed during these attacks on healthcare. And among them are, as we know, uh, uh, 340 healthcare workers and then 319 civilians, like the ones who have been killed in Nasser Hospital. And I want to underline this point because this don't make Nasser Hospital uh, a sort of a, a special case. Right. Uh, it, it's like human memory uh, has been reduced down to not a week, but two days. This has been going on for four months, for heaven's sake. The UN has known it. All the foreign departments of the, of the world have known it. And only one state. Republic of South Africa had the bravery and the courage and the decency to stand up and say, stop it and go to the ICJ and demand a stop. And there is no white government in the Western world, to my knowledge, that has supported the uh, RSA case in the ICJ. It's only uh, governments from the global South. So even that step to try to control these crimes against humanity and this genocide has not been supported by the Western government. Where are they? What's happening? Are we entering into a new dark era of neocolonialism? I fear that's what we're seeing. And just to, to, to re report a, a little bit more on this, uh, it's a very good graph. It's actually summing up uh, the attacks in every one of the four governorates in Gaza and how many hospitals. I'm sorry, five governorates, uh, and how many hospitals have been damaged and how many hospitals are out of function. But don't forget that 659 staff, patients and civilians have been killed during 378 Israeli attacks on healthcare facilities. The primary healthcare sector in Gaza is almost down to zero. Uh, there has been... Um, you know, so many attacks on the clinics and they are almost all of them out of function. They have destroyed almost 100 ambulances and they have uh, closed down uh, most of the hospitals. Only um, six, I believe, are now working, three in the north and three or four in the south. But these numbers are, are changing every day. And <clears throat> one more documentation is the right to health report from who and this is the report from 2022 and they have a special chapter which is called health attacks if you think this number 378 during the four months of this attack is special just read this report they are reporting you know every single attack and from 2019 to 2021 WHO is reporting 563 attacks on Palestinian healthcare in Gaza and the West Bank. Right. So thousands of attacks going unpunished, impunity, absolutely no consequences for the Israeli occupation forces, these right. attacks. Right. Uh, I have one more question, then I, I want to turn it over to Tamara. Um, As we've said, you mentioned necropolitics, and and as we've said before, the hospitals are the target, as as you just showed in those graphs. Um, this is not a new 
phenomenon, Israel has consistently over the last 75 years targeted medical facilities, medical workers, patients. Um, the terrorization of the most vulnerable, the wounded, the sick, the chronically ill, the mothers in labor, the premature babies, the children, their terrified parents. This is classic Israeli tactic. What can you say about what necropolitics means, the necropolitics of the Israeli state, and why hospitals are the systematic target in Gaza right now? That's a very big question, Nora. <laughs> I don't really know where to start. Um, I understand necropolitics, according to, to the brilliant book by, by Mr. Achille, as um, a description of our world as of today uh, with ever-increasing inequality and ever-increasing racism. And as I, I, as I mentioned, this, these numbers of of uh, supporters to the uh, South African case in the International Court of Justice, where the Western world, the Western governments are absent in supporting the case, let alone the lack of firm, concrete um, sanctions against Israel to stop these vicious attacks as they have been sanctioning Russia. Um, but it seems like this, Necropolitics is part of a, of a Western new wave of militarization, of terror, state terror, as um, a resurgence of uh, both racist and in Europe, right-wing development, fascism, outright fascism, and, and the new government in Israel with fascist members, and uh, very nationalist politics. and. Um, it is like some people are forced and um, threatened and targeted into a suspension of life where they live in a situation somewhere between life and death, like the 2.2 million people in Gaza now are forced to live so close to death that a, a friend of mine actually texted me the other day from Rafa and he said, I dream that Israelis drop a nuclear bomb on us so we can all go to heaven instead of suffering this constant fear and seeing our loved ones being torn apart day by day. And, and, and the combination of starvation, lack of water, lack of any kind of, uh, of safe place because they have bombed all the uh, homes, and putting people into the open streets or in the tents, whatever. And then in addition to this life-threatening starvation and lack of water and lack of warmth, actually, hypothermia, you have this constant targeted bombing, even in places that Israelis have said, we declare this as a safe place. Kanyunis, not safe. Rafa, not safe. So there is a, a constant element of lying betrayal all the time, which is also being accepted by the Western powers and, and the United States. So you have put this large group, the Palestinian people in the West Bank and in Gaza and in the diaspora, in the camps in Lebanon, in, in, in Jordan and in Syria, under such dire living conditions that nobody else would have been put under had they been white and blue eyed in order to force them as a new, a new people that are denied the rights that we take for granted for all people, for white people. But now we are we are just seeing that all the declarations of human rights, of children's rights, and blah, 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 and conventions here and conventions there, they are not even worth the paper they signed on because this new necropolitics is coming in as a new way for the Western powers, headed, spearheaded by these thugs in the occupation army of Israel to signal to the global south that we're after you. Don't feel safe. We are actually able to do this to you. And if any of you ever think of making a resistance, an armed resistance like the Palestinian people in Gaza and the West Bank, this is what awaits you. So it, it's a threat. It's a, it's a warning sign. 
to anybody who picks up a weapon to defend your family, your fishing boat, your 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 horse, your home, your school, your university, your mosque, your decency, your dignity, your nationality, your ground, your soil. Don't even think about it because we will not only kill you, we will humiliate you and we will attack everything that supports you, including your educational system, your healthcare system, your police, everything that makes a society coherent. So, so I think the answer to why, why healthcare, why hospitals, why healthcare stations has a, a, a complex answer because healthcare is one of the most outspoken symbols of a civilized society and hospitals i call them the temples of of uh, mercy the temples of compassion and co and care for people you know if you break a leg if your child gets a fever if your your uh, your beloved one is suddenly unconscious you can go to these castles of light and care around the clock they're safe you can go with a taxi or an ambulance and there are people there two o'clock in the morning six o'clock in the morning in the afternoon who knows what they're doing they're educated they're paid to be there for you such a beautiful symbol of a caring society a welfare state which makes people feel safe and loyal to the society and the leadership who provides these things uh, in my country it's free of charge because i live in a social democratic society you don't have to pay you don't have to have any insurance you can go to any hospital you like and if you're in a fighting situation or in a disaster a natural disaster the hospitals are so important for the resilience of the population along with the primary health care system and the ambulance system so for a people fighting the armed struggle like the palestinian people are doing in gaza and in the west bank the healthcare system is part of the resistance, not an armed part. It's a legal part of the resistance because every society has the right to have a healthcare system. And that's why the healthcare system is, is protected by the Geneva Convention. And the fourth Geneva Convention is, is utterly clear, has always been. And that's why these attacks on healthcare that are so well documented and, and, and the, most, the most extreme, the most brutal examples or the situations like we have in Nassar medical complex now, where they're shooting and killing staff and patients inside. And the situation we had in uh, uh, the West Bank, where they again uh, dressed up like doctors, fake doctors and, and, and relatives coming and, and hid their weapons and went into this room and shot and killed this patient who was actually immobilized, this Palestinian young man and his two companions killed him, executed him and his two companions under the disguise of being medical personnel. The reason why this is so serious and why, why it is not stopped is so serious is that it threatens the immunity of the healthcare system and the safe network, the safety network that the healthcare system provides to people around the world. And in particular, when there are times of disasters, wars, and um, other adversities where we really need the healthcare system. So it's part of the genocide. It's part of the it's part of the Israeli tactique to discourage the Palestinian people to resist. It's an attack on the popular broad-based resistance, not the armed resistance alone, but the resistance as a people, the sumud of the Palestinian people. The steadfastness. Yeah, I wanted to contrast everything that you just said about the necropolitics of the Israeli state and of Zionism more generally with the larger theme of the dedication and the selflessness displayed by doctors in Gaza, which has been completely unparalleled in anything I've ever seen in my lifetime or read about. You know, we, he we hear all of these heroic stories about Palestinian medical students who, of course, now have nowhere to study since Israel just systematically destroyed almost every single university in Gaza who have seamlessly integrated into the permanent staff and contributed tirelessly to surgical procedures and routine medical tasks. A lot of them were blogging um, videos of them inside the hospitals doing that kind of work. 
we have doctors like Ghassan Abu Sitte, a British Palestinian doctor who left the comfort of his home in London and just days after Israel launched its genocidal campaign in Gaza, um, went there to offer his expertise and work shoulder to shoulder with Palestinian medical staff uh, and became truly one of the linchpins in Al-Shifa Hospital and Al-Ahli um, Hospital. Um, there's, there's, there's all of these stories that we heard. There's the tale of the pharmacist who lost his livelihood when Israel destroyed his pharmacy in one neighborhood and he became also an integral part of um, the, the, the surgical staff, uh, worked alongside Dr. Ghassan Abu Sitte. There's Dr. Hamam al who was killed with an Israeli military um, artillery, artillery shell that hit his family's home, his wife's home, and killed several members of his family. And famously, in one of his last interviews, he said, you think I went to medical school and, and postgraduate studies for 14 years in order to abandon my patients and think only of myself and my family? And there's, of course, you, Dr. Mads, who spent years going to Gaza during every war and risking your life uh, to work shoulder to shoulder with these medical professionals. These anecdotes, and you touched on this, but I want to, you know, I want you to talk about it more. They underscore a deeply rooted ethos of service within Gaza's medical community. And uh, it's, it's, it's truly like a form of revolutionary love. This ethos, I think, reflects an enduring tradition in medicine, um, a philosophy in medicine and and exemplified in the fabric of healthcare in Gaza. Um, this is, of course, you know, you said you you live in a country where you have healthcare available, but in countries like the United States, where a fragmented healthcare system is just controlled by privatization and insurance, people forget the true ethic ethics and philosophy of medicine, which is an almost now an old world philosophy of giving that transcends bureaucracy, that transcends commercial interests, that transcends the financial um, uh, access that people have to that kind of healthcare. And, you know, drawing on your experience from working shoulder to shoulder to these incredible dedicated professionals in Gaza uh, who have this philosophy of service, can you please talk about that and maybe also give advice to young doctors on how they can sort maintain this sort of ethic in, in their work and possibly even what they can do um, if they wish to give back to Palestine. Yeah, you're absolutely right, of course. And I, I don't miss any opportunity to talk about the real heroes who are precisely the healthcare workers uh, the, you know, the, the, the nurses, not to forget, uh, the paramedics in the ambulance system, uh, the students, not only the medical students, the nursing students, um, the midwives, and of course the doctors. Uh, I say it in that order because the doctors uh, very often are sort of always, always focused. But you're absolutely right. I, I've, I've been saying throughout these four months that the healthcare workers in Gaza are holding the moral compass of the world through these dark months because they never yielded. They never yield and they keep going and they have been standing by their patients and they have been very vocal, as you say, as you quoted. I remember that interview very well. And he was at the brink of, he was actually crying when he gave that interview. And this dedication for me has been an important guide through my 40 years working with the Palestinians. It started uh, in, in Beirut in 82 and during the bombing of Beirut and the siege of Beirut. Israelis did just the same. They cut the water, the food, the electricity, the medical supplies, the medical teams who were smuggled in. And to see the heroism of these quite young Palestinian uh, medical uh, workers, nurses and doctors and, and ambulance paramedics made a deep impression on me, it, it became a life-changing experience. And every time I go to Gaza, whether it's during bombing or in between when we do the research or teach or have projects in training people, 
I get this same sense as you describe of a, a very, very deep compassion for life, a compassion for serving others almost like I mean, I'm a Marxist, I'm, I'm, I'm a socialist, I'm a left winger, I'm you know, I've always been that, and, and my, my urge to use medicine as a tool of justice for uprights and to side up with the people fighting against injustice has always been part of my, my determination as a doctor. But to come to Gaza and to the West Bank and to see how these colleagues of mine in all different specialties and, and, and professional positions, how they serve their people uh, is a reminder to me that you don't have to live in a in a well off western capitalist country in order to to give uh, to give uh, from your professionalism because you're well fed and you're you know you're in a safe position and you have everything you need so you have this little extra to be an activist or a social entrepreneur or anything in Gaza and in the West Bank, it's it's this huge, deep-rooted dedication to serve their people. Um, you could call it the medical salud, or you could call it the medical persistence, or you could go back to, to Rudolf Firkov, who was a European pathologist who died in 1901. And he was the, the founder of public health as a specialty in medicine. And he was very pronounced. He said that politics and medicine are two sides of the same thing. It's about society and the conditions, the living conditions for people. And he also said that the doctor should be the advocate of the poor. The doctor should be the advocate of the poor because that's where the healthcare workers are needed. It's not needed for the rich people who can buy a private plane and go to a private clinic in, in whatever, uh, anywhere in the world. They always manage. But for the majority of people, the healthcare workers are so important as their servants and as somebody who sides up with them and choose side with them. And to me, the deepest uh, ethics and ethos of medicine is to side up with those who need you. Not to be neutral, not to stand on the outside and say, I will not comment on the polit politics of this. I will not comment on the Israeli army's uh, attack on hospital. I will only comment on this and this patient. Fine, but then you are not serving as an advocate of the less fortunate. You have to choose side. Neutrality, neutrality in a position of oppression being executed against a large numbers of people or even in a one-to-one -one situation, neutrality will end you on the side of the oppressor, as said uh, the famous bishop from South Africa. And, and this neutrality of medicine is fake. Medicine should actively choose side with the less fortunate, with the oppressed, with the occupied, with the bombed ones, and say, we are on your side. We will stay with you. We will not abandon you. And we will even risk our lives to serve you. And that's what we see in Gaza. And I'm, I'm immensely touched by the courage and the human dignity of the healthcare workers. And I want to mention one person who is often not mentioned, and that is uh, Dr. Yusuf Aburish. He's the Minister of Health in Gaza. Few people even know his name. I've known him, known him for 12, 13 years. And he's been the Minister of Health for the last uh, 12 years, I think. He's a pediatrician. He's quite young. He's married. He has, I believe, five kids. And he's an extremely warm human being. And he's one of my absolute role models in this world. He has been on call for four months, night and day, never left his position as the leader of this incredibly, uh, brutally attacked healthcare system. And every time I talk to him, he has not given up. But he asked the question, how can this be allowed to go on? But people like him, and I could mention lots of other names to you. They are really uh, shining uh, lighthouses for the world currently to, 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 to give us direction in this chaotic world of, of, of lies, of propaganda, 
of racism and of devaluation of human value that we see. I think that <clears throat> these leaders and, 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 and the more experienced uh, staff, staffers in the healthcare system in Gaza are the educators of the young uh, medical workers, as, as you pointed to, Tamara. And uh, uh, you're right. I mean, uh, in uh, Al-Aqsa Hospital, uh, Dr. Khalil told me that the second year, no, the first year's medical students were working as scrub nurses. The second year, we're working as interns. And the third year, medical students were working as, as full-fledged surgeons, the learning curve being absolutely vertical. And I've been teaching and training medical students in Gaza for uh, more than 10 years. And I, I never stop to be impressed by their dedication and their willingness to stretch far beyond just you know accumulating knowledge and, 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 and passing their exams. We've had a, a, a program which has been very successful, which is called You Can Save a Life, where, where we train medical students to become instructors. We train them the didactics and the, you know, the, the teaching tools on how to train lay people in Gaza, uh, CPR, airway control, bleeding control, how to stop bleeding and how to keep the patient warm and give encouragement and emotional support. And then this army of young medical students go to the communities, to the refugee camps, to schools, to, to labor unions, to workplaces, and they train people for three hours. And then they get a little bag by the end. Uh, I even have it here because it's such an important symbol for me. So this is the You Can Save a Life project in uh, Gaza, where we have all the steps for life saving here in Arabic. And every participant, every lay person gets this little bag. And here you have an elastic bandage and goes to pack a bleeding wound and to put on, an, uh, not a tourniquet, but an elastic bandage. And this is such a, a dear symbol to me because it shows you exactly what you point to, Tamara, the willingness of the healthcare providers in Gaza to serve their people, even as young medical students. And these people should once we have ceasefire, I hope that these leaders and these clinicians and these medical students are invited around the world to teach and to share their experience, both with colonialism and the, the forces of death and destruction, and about what you can do as an individual and a group to resist these forces, and how you can practically improvise and, and apply your knowledge in ways you never thought you could because of lack of water and lack of supplies and lack of electricity and everything you can still continue to work as they do and by the way the video you showed from Nasser hospital i think the the spray of water was actually sewage because the whole emergency department was flooded with sewage because of the attacks i'm not sure about that but i think because they're left without water now so yes absolutely and um, we should never stop to um, salute and to uh, support and to respect the whole medical community in Gaza and the West Bank for their the fights that they are taking on behalf of humanity because that's what they're doing they show us what it means to be human in a situation where all the powers and all the forces are trying to degrade them in all possible ways, torture, undressing, attacking, killing, uh, squeezing and, and strangulating, lack of resources, electricity, everything. Such a systematic racist mm -hmm. attempt to take away every human dignity from them. They stand tall, they continue to treat and they continue to serve their people. They are our beacons of light in a dark time they are they are and um, yeah and this is, this is what brings me to the next point which is that um not only has israel you know completely destroyed several hospitals not a single hospital in gaza out of the 36 remains fully functional there are some that are partially functional there are some that are barely functional, but not a single one out of the 36 remains fully functional. But something Dr. Abusitte said that really stayed with me 
is that not only is Israel systematically targeting medical facilities, but they are targeting medical professionals. Mm. And Israel's objective in targeting medical professionals is to cripple the health sector by killing an entire generation of doctors to the extent that building the hospitals after the genocide would not even suffice to restore the health sector. I mean, it's it's such an unspeakable thing, um, but this is all part of Israel's goal to make Gaza completely uninhabitable and compelling Palestinians to leave the Gaza Strip, which is one of Israel's ultimate war, goal, war goals. Um, and I'm deeply troubled to, uh, to pose this question to you, Dr. Mads, but which doctors that you know of that Israel has killed whose expertise and experience are nearly irreplaceable, especially within such a time frame? And what are the repercussions of decimating an entire health system in this way? I mean, we don't have many precedents that we can compare this to. Hmm. Uh, let me just repeat the latest numbers, uh, 340 uh, healthcare workers killed. Uh, we don't know how many injured, but uh, probably by the hundreds, if not thousand. And um, more than a hundred currently being in prison or in concentration camp. Um, I may have bit more of an optimistic view on the future because both universities, the two big ones, the Islamic and Al-Azhar University, they had uh, almost doubled their classes in medical school the last uh, two years. Um, they have a steady, they've had a steady production of doctors. There is actually, it's been hard for Palestinian freshmen, uh, interns to, to get jobs, paid jobs, because both because of the, the lack of positions and, and because of the, the failing economy due to the siege and the, the Ramallah-Gaza conflict. Um, but there is a new generation of young medical workers, uh, some of them being handpicked to go to Geneva, to the headquarters of WHO, because they're so damn good. And all of them very hardworking. Imagine having the capacity to, to complete medical school during siege and a repetitious bombing. I mean, if you're if you're if you're younger than 16 years in Gaza today, you haven't had anything but siege and bombing. And many of the medical students have had the majority of their lifetime, the most of their lifetime, they have been under hardship with uh, with siege and um, and bombing and limited access to travel still they have completed medical school. So there is an army of young medical doctors, young nurses, young health entrepreneurs from the two big universities that are, of course, extremely exhausted. They are traumatized. But let's look at the other side. Let's look at the, the capacity to, to continue to function, which the examples that you mentioned, Tamara, are, are just, you know, there are so many examples that none of these professionals, regardless of type of medical profession, have been willing to give up and, and, and flee and, and, and escape. They have been really staying by uh, their patients and they have gained an enormous experience, enormous experience in how to comply with the situation, which is seemingly completely impossible to solve. I mean, running a hospital with the double number of patients compared to the number of beds you have, you know, we soft skinned, inexperienced Western whites, we would have just broken down and, and go into fetus position and just cry. They don't do that. They find solutions. And I have a number of stories with some fantastic clinical examples of how they have been improvising and how they have been able to save life. All this massive experience of surviving, of working together, of resisting, of resisting, is a capital 
for a, a future Palestinian recovery of their healthcare system. But it has to be Palestinian. And what I fear most now is that Gaza is going to be recolonized and become a new Afghanistan, totally donor dependent, totally NGO dependent, because the uh, good willing NGO energies and, and entrepreneurs from the private sector will come in and say, yeah, we can make a healthcare system here. We, we're going to do this and that. And then the, just, you know, sidetrack the Palestinian leadership. And I don't know if you, do you know Dr. Yusuf Abu Rish? Do you know of him? Have you heard his speeches? You know him? Um, I've heard uh, his name. I mean, most mostly yeah, it's uh, Ashraf Akedra. Yeah. But the uh, that, that's the spokesperson, of course. Yeah. But if you look at the number of people who have been commenting on the healthcare situation in Gaza, uh, and you count the number of Palestinian voices versus the white voices, it's uh, 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 just a, a, a total imbalance. So I think my my answer to your uh, your concern, uh, Tamara, is that. And they say, you know, Dr. Yusuf have been saying for, for weeks, he says, let's restart the Palestinian healthcare system. Let's, let's restart the hospitals. They're not that damaged. The main problem for the hospital function in Gaza is lack of water, electricity, fuel, and medical supplies, and security. There are a few hospitals who has holes in the wall, who has some parts of it uh, bombed. But it's not like it, all the hospitals look like northern Gaza, all flattened. That, that's a few hospitals that have been completely flattened. The other day, I got a voicemail from uh, uh, Dr. Marwan Abu Saida, a very experienced surgeon, and they were starting up Shifa again. They were starting with surgery in Shifa. And they say, as long as we can get water and fuel and electricity, we can start. We have the people, and for sure, we have the patients needing treatment. So if they could only be left alone and have security, water, fuel, uh, food and medical provisions, and of course, international teams who can uh, support them, um, it should not be that difficult to restart the hospital function in Gaza. But that, of course, demands a political situation where Israel is stopped and where these Israeli forces are you know, have to leave Gaza and, and allow the Palestinians, not allow, but but that the Palestinians can take care of their own future. Um, I don't know if you know what the, the city arms of Gaza City is. You know, every city has these arms. It is actually Bird Phoenix. And it's been Bird Phoenix for many, many centuries. And I love that because Gaza City has been racing from the ashes again and again and again. And I have series of pictures with bomb buildings from, you know, this is half a year ago. Now it has been re-established. This function was bombed. It's re-established. So the, 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 the uh, it's hard to imagine how industrious the Palestinian people are all over, how hard they work and how often they have been able to reconstruct Gaza after 2006, 9, 12, 14, 21. And of course, now it's worse than ever. But with the joint forces, not only of the Palestinian healthcare workers, but all the healthcare workers in the world now who wants to support um, Gaza's healthcare and the West Bank's healthcare, we can make, if, if we get our act together, we could make medical brigades going to Gaza for the next 10 years. We could mobilize young medical students, nursing students, whoever, engineers to go to Gaza, not to take over. But to ask the Palestinians, where do you need us? How can we fit in? How can we stand shoulder to shoulder? How can we, with our hands, help you to get the rubble away and, and re-establish and rebuild Gaza as a, as a bird phoenix? So that's my prospect. And that's our duty now. Like we way back, we had brigades going to Cuba because Cuba Cuban healthcare system was very uh, nouveau to many of the Western uh, medical professionals. So that's my that's my prescription. No humanitarian or medical effort can solve the situation now. The most important medical provision now is immediate ceasefire, long lasting. It's immediate lifting of the siege. 
It's immediate international control of all influx of good stuff and and uh, and uh, fuel and trucks to Gaza, not under in Israeli control. And it is probably an intermediate peacekeeping force from the UN, as we've had in Lebanon and in Gaza before. In the 50s, we had there were US, UN peacekeeping forces. And then on our side, organizing an international deluge of support, not wordy, not not theoretical, not demonstrations, but people actually traveling in the amount with the with the with the with the professionalism, with the skills that are needed and designed by the Palestinians, and then work on the Palestinian leadership to rebuild Gaza. And then for these youngsters going there, they will learn from the Palestinian medical students and the young doctors and the nurses and the paramedics. They will learn a lesson they cannot learn anywhere else. So that's our duty. And I, I think it can be a bright future. future. Mads, just a couple of questions left. Um, you recently were in Jordan uh, and you were on a panel of the Jordanian Medical Syndicate uh, just, just a week or so ago with uh, Drs. Hassan Abu Sitta and Bilal Azam. And Dr. Azam gave testimony about his two colleagues, Dr. Mohammed Al Ran and the head of Al Shifa Hospital, Dr. Mohammed Abu Salmiya, who was. Uh, both were kidnapped uh, and tortured by the Israeli military. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Sal Abu Salmiya was taken in November by Israeli forces. And uh, and and uh, on the panel, Dr. Bilal Azam um, talked about what he said had happened to these two doctors. And can you tell us a little bit about um, that testimony and how Israel has been treating these pillars of um, of the of Gaza's medical system. Yeah, and uh, it's also a painful, extremely painful story. I, I, I'll just share with you a picture from 2011, uh, if you can see that. And uh, you see me here on this. Ah, wait a second. Um, you see a, a bunch of doctors and uh, the one standing next to the lady, Muna, is Dr. Mohammed ed -Rum. And then it's me and then it's the head of the uh, gastrosurgical unit in my university hospital. This picture is taken here in Tromsø in my university clinic. Because Mohammed ed -Rum, he was invited to be a senior surgical trainee. This is my hospital director at that time, and Dr. Alron is the one with the glasses. They stayed here for three months to learn some very important uh, endoscopic surgery, namely surgery for a pelvic floor insufficiency, which is very prevalent in Gaza because of the high fertility rate and because of the social stigma connected to incontinence in women. So we invited these two as part of a very systematic program to build capacity in Gaza to have surgical treatment of uh, incontinence in women. And we happen to be the National uh, Competence Center in Norway for uh, incompetence and, and incontinence in women. So I got to know Mohamed el Ron very well. He's been here in my home and had dinner many times out in my kitchen. He's a fantastic doctor uh extremely popular among the medical students it was one of the most popular lecturers and i just talked with a, one of my students the other day and she said that he always would would look up when there was a student in the or to make sure that the student would get access to the operating field so uh, a, a hundred percent 200 percent dedicated medical doctor a family man and uh, a surgeon who has served his people for 25 years and he was the medical director at Al Auda Hospital, I believe, when he was arrested. And he was uh, taken away to one of these concentration camps and he was severely tortured and abused. They forced him to crawl on his floor. Uh, they abused him, uh, they beat him. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm not going to show you the last picture because there is a picture of, of my brother when he came out from uh, that. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, since it's probably known, I'll show it to you. Uh, he's sitting in his, uh, his pajamas there in the white to the 
with the, with the hat on, and the other picture is from before he was uh, arrested. So he was he was tortured, he was abused, and uh, the reason was that he was a medical doctor serving his people, a Palestinian. Had this happened to a Ukrainian doctor, with Russians doing the same, the whole Western world would be standing on the chairs shouting. And the Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, would have issued multiple complaints and, and protests to the Russian government. When this happens, and, and Mohammed al Roni is not the only one, as you said, the director of, of Shifa is still on in the concentration camp. And it is said that they have broken both his arms. And as I told you, my very close colleague, Dr. Dr. N uh, was released today, according to his son, also tortured. And I, I just got some picture, pictures while we were talking. I could see he was he was broken down in the same way as Mohammed al Ron was. Of course, torture is a disgusting, inhuman way of forcing people to do things they never should be forced to do. And why do they do it? They want to extract from them under torture uh, confession that yes, my hospital was a uh, Hamas base. They don't get these confessions because it's a lie. It's not true. Number one, and because number two, these brothers are decent people. They don't lie, and they don't lie even under pressure. They might squeeze some confessions out of somebody under torture, but what we're seeing is another brutal attack on the Palestinian healthcare by capturing the leaders and torturing them. And don't forget that the convoy of ambulances leaving Shifa with the director going to Rafa was guaranteed security by the United Nations and WHO. Guaranteed coordination. They came halfway, the Israelis stopped them. The commander of that group, I'm told, said, I have no orders to let you through. I have my orders to go through every group coming from the north to the south. They held them for seven hours. They were violent against patients and ambulance staff and the doctors. And they arrested him. And I believe it was four, three or four other doctors who have disappeared under the blue flag, under guarantees from the United Nations that you are safe in our hands. What a betrayal. And what uh, what a what a total collapse of the United Nations authority, because the follow up was, of course, that Dr. Yusuf Abrish wrote a letter to the Secretary General and demanded follow up and demanded the release of these arrested uh, healthcare workers and doctors. Uh, and last time I talked to him, they hadn't even got uh, an answer from the United Nations. So the circumstances, the narrative, the torture, the abuse of power, it's all in the hands of the Israeli government, the Israeli occupation forces and the United States. And they know every single detail of it. This, nothing of this is unknown to secret service or to the intelligence, the deeper intelligence in the United States. And of course, Shin Bet and, and Mossad and all these not only know about it, but they're leading it. Thank you, Dr. Mads. Um, it's just unspeakable. Um, maybe as one last question, um, you know, since October 7th, around uh, 29,000 Palestinians in Gaza have been killed. This number is from the health ministry in Gaza. Of course, whenever this is reported in Western media, they qualify it as the Hamas controlled Palestinian health ministry in Gaza. When in reality, actually the numbers that the health ministry documents are quite conservative um, because they only count those who enter through the Gaza healthcare system or 
uh, exit through the morgues. They don't really count those missing or trapped, even if they were trapped for weeks or months under the rubble of their homes as uh, part of that uh, toll. Um, but what we're, you know, what I don't see enough conversation about is the scale of the injuries alongside the fatalities. Um, and when you look closely, I mean, the health ministry in Gaza s says it's almost 70,000 Palestinians injured uh, since, the beginning, since the beginning of Israel's genocidal war. And um, I wanted to ask you, what does sustaining an injury mean uh, for Palestinians in Gaza? Because beyond the immediate physical trauma, injuries can have a very lasting impact on people and their families. They change lives. I mean, th these, these injuries are often limb amputations. They, they affect people's mobility. They cause chronic pain. It's, this is all apart from the psychological trauma and disability that they cause. And we're a very resilient society, but you know, without access to medical care and rehabilitation services and the psychological support that the injured and their families need in order to carry on with their lives, what can 3% of an entire population injured mean for a society? That's, I mean, 70,000 is 3% of Gaza's population. Hmm. Yeah, you're right. And uh, this is today's uh, report from Orcha. And I urge all your viewers to subscribe to it. You can just go in and uh, do a Google on uh, flash report on uh, hostilities in the Gaza Strip. This comes uh, every day or every second day. And Ocha, and Ocha is the UN monitoring group, uh, yeah. which the Office of Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, OPT. And there you see the numbers you mentioned. So it's 68,552. And you see these two graphs underneath. The red one is the number of killed from the, 4th, uh, the, the 7th of October. And the gray one are the number of injured. And again, these numbers have been known day by day by all the governments. So to your question, we have done quite a bit of research on these injuries and in particular on the traumatic amputations. And um, these papers were published in The Lancet and in British Medical Journal and in uh, a few other uh, prestigious medical journals. And we have shown a few things. Number one, that if you're amputated, you will need an average of 10 surgical operations during the follow-up. And the younger you are, the more surgeries you will need because your body grows. And these surgeries are to both take care of the wound, which may need what we call debridement or redressings under anesthesia, because it's quite painful to, to get away dead tissue and to make sure you don't get into a septicemia during the first weeks or month, depending on the type of the wound. You never close a war wound immediately, then you will have have septicemia. You always treat it open and then you have to dress it morning and evening at least, if not three times a day. And then comes the time of, of establishing the stump, you know, how you make the flap and how you adjust uh, the uh, cut off bone to the muscle tissue and, and the skin in order to have a stump that can fit a prosthesis. And then you need to fit the prosthesis and then you need to train to use the prosthesis and to retrain your way of walking or, or using your hands. So it's, it's a long and tedious road to re-establish function. The good thing is that most young people are quite apt in, uh, in, in, in learning new skills. We know from the statistics uh, that an average, I think of 10 kids have been amputated every day for four months. So there is a there is an there is an avalanche of, of kids with amputations that needs to be looked after. And of course we need to re-establish the Palestinian proper um, prosthesis service, which was well served in the ALPC, artificial 
limb and prosthesis workshop in Gaza, which was supported by ICRC. And we have been fundraising from Norway to AOPC uh, since 2006, actually. They have a brilliant staff, had the brilliant staff. They had all the workshops you need to make prosthesis, state of the art, and they were extremely productive and much of our research was anchored there. Now we are told that the building is completely emptied by the Israeli occupation forces. They've stolen everything inside. The staff, of course, has been forced to, uh, to go to Rafa, but there is, uh, 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 there is a, a, a fundament of competence and experience in Palestine by Palestinians in both making prosthesis and do the rehabilitation and the training. They are actually very advanced. And in particular, after the Great March of Return, there were lots and lots of new amputees who were getting their treatment there and in the other center in, in Gaza. Um, so again, back to what we discussed, I think the important thing is to have a focus on rehabilitation and, um, uh, and making of prosthesis uh, in Gaza and support and develop the Palestinian leadership on the rehabilitation process. We may support with, with you know, skilled people and funding for rebuilding and machinery and all that. But again, don't make uh, Palestine, don't make Gaza and new Afghanistan. Respect, restore and support the Palestinian capacity. Uh, for the psychosocial rehabilitation, we also have new knowledge, which is developed by Gaza Community Mental Health Center, which is a brilliant uh, clinical center that has done some remarkable academic research together with researchers from Italy uh, and from uh, Finland. Uh, Gudio Veronesa, a professor of psychology in, in Northern Italy, has done some very important uh, studies on what are the protective factors against PTSD and, and, and long-term stress in Palestinian children, in the camps, in the West Bank and in Gaza. And actually from the bomb rides we have had so far, which are not comparable to what we have now, it is a remarkably a low percentage of the kids who develop long-term problems depends a little bit on how you look at it. Depends about if you are from the Western society who are seeing PTSD everywhere. Even if you just had a, a somebody shouting at you on your way to, to work, you get PTSD. Uh, you know, uh, it's been sort of a, a fashionable diagnosis to have. But if you have stringent uh, criteria, uh, the majority of Palestinian children in Gaza, they fare quite well after even attacks like 2014. And what are the protective factors? Family and psychosocial support in the family first and foremost. Secondly, faith. Thirdly, to be engaged in a larger, uh, meaningful collective project. And for Palestinians, it's Palestine. It's a free Palestine. You know, the, the, the struggle has a, a connotation, a framework, which is beyond yourself and your family. It's a collective, uh, unending ambition and struggle to get back a free Palestine. And then it is, of course, a support from caring others. Uh, and that's where solidarity comes in. Not to be alone. Not to have that horrible feeling that many Palestinians in Gaza can have, that the world has forgotten us. The world doesn't give shit about us. So practical solidarity, coming back and coming back and coming back uh, is an important feature of solidarity. And of course, asking the question, what can we do to support you? Instead of rushing in with uh, everything that the Western world thinks they want and need, and a, a sort of a, a pretty uh, hostile takeover of, of uh, society functions, everything from education to healthcare to to communication, but all the time, side by side, shoulder to shoulder, support them. But the most important thing for the resilience and the post-traumatic growth, PTG, is actually an intact family, being in your, your own culture, your language, your faith, your, your food, your, you know, the, the whole scent of, of, of your culture, 
for the children that's in, incredibly important and then be listened to you know to respect the children's uh, uh, very lively narrative uh, uh, digestions of the trauma through dreams and through storytelling and, and drawing, all that, we know these tools. But given these quite simple factors, you can have a very protective effect and you can actually survive even this trauma. But there is a big but here because the genocidal character of this attack has split so many families and there are so many family members lost that of course for the orphanated children and for the children with uh, with big losses in the family this is a new reality but my warning is don't start an export of palestinian children from gaza try to reinforce their networks and their capacities in gaza by restoring the the home the buildings you know the the the, the whole habitat and the society functions, schools, and um, and healthcare. And one thing which is not much talked about, which is in this last uh, uh, Ocean report, they say that there are currently 625,000 students with no access to education. And that is 100% of the more than half a million youngsters from primary school, secondary school, college universities they are without any access to education they have killed 4660 students and 239 educational staff so they have killed almost 5000 students and teachers and 92% of the school buildings are used as shelters uh, are either used as shelters or they have been uh, sustaining damage and you know that both the islamic university and al-azhar university have been by and large bombed and destroyed so there is more than half a million students that needs to to immediately uh, get back to some sort of, of studying and that also needs to be restored so it's, there's a lot of work to do we just have to you know curl up our arms and, and get going to work with solidarity Absolutely. Dr. Mads Gilbert, um, thank you so much for spending so much time with us today uh, and for you know, saluting the, the heroes of the Palestinian health community, patients, the doctors, the nurses, the staff, the janitors, uh, all of the workers who, who really are the glue um, underneath the most uh, terrifying conditions, holding, holding the community together. Um, and uh, where can people find uh, your writing, your work, your appearances? Where can people get in touch with you? I'm not a champion of social media. I've never been there, but I made an account on X Twitter uh, from Cairo. And it is very simple. It's D-R-M-A-D-S-G-I-L-B-E-R-T, uh, uh, Dr. Matt Gilbert, without points or anything, just in one word. That's on Twitter, and it's the same on uh, Instagram. And then um, I am on WhatsApp. Uh, <laughs> and you can contact me there. Uh, and uh, if you want to read our uh, our science and our publications, you can just do a, a Google Scholar search on my name and plus Palestine or plus Gaza, and you'll get all the papers. Um, and um, I think we need what I have coined evidence-based solidarity. And by evidence-based solidarity, I mean knowledge-based solidarity. I'm all in favor of flags and demonstrations and slogans. That's an, an incredibly important way to amass support and solidarity. But we also need to go beyond the slogans and, and dive deep into the numbers. And that's why I urge you to follow the different sources with numbers and facts and statistics because when you argue with someone you can you know you can just print these two pages this is the this this is you know uh, the very complementary attacks on healthcare this one and here the updated statistics on killed wounded and all the other things and hand it to your neighbor bring it to your workplace distribute in your classroom the facts are actually the strongest arguments against the settler colonial 
brutality and atrocities of Israel and the arguments against the complicity of the United States. And we need more evidence-based solidarity and we need more solidarity from everyone. Kolona Gaza, Kolona Palestine, Palestine Hatta Nasser, and Gaza Hatta Nasser, I'm sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Mads. What an honor, Dr. Mads. Thank you very much. Thank you for the good work you do because you are, the journalists are such an important group now to counteract the mainstream media and all the lies because Israel is a lie machine. Mm -hmm. 100%. <laughs> Can't keep up with their own lives. No. <laughs> Thanks, Mads. Take care. Thank you. Take care, you too. Awesome. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit like, leave a comment. These engagements help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to get around Silicon Valley censorship as much as possible. It does make a difference. You can also support our journalism by going to electronicintifada.net and clicking on donate now. Thank you.